Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Gallucci, and uh, I am one of your co-hosts for a new show that we have. We're calling it Learning Space. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, different educational topics. Um, Pamela, do you want to take over some? Right. So, so the basic idea is is last semester, as as many of you noticed, last fall and early winter, we were running roughly every Wednesday Google Hangouts on air that were covering a whole variety of different topics, from hardcore news and science to the engineering of Mars Curiosity Laboratory, to even things like the Google Lunar X Prize Moonbots project, which gets kids involved in trying to figure out how to effectively explore our moon. Well, as we move into the new year, we've decided that we're going to take all these little topics that we're trying to cram into one day a week, and we're going to spread this all out. And Wednesdays is our learning space day. We're, we're going to be talking about all the ways that we can help you and your kids and our communities uh, reach out into space and uh, understand that astronomy is one of those things that starts with a bang and is full of explosions. and, and uh, we promised that we would have a bang involved in the launch of this show. Yeah, Our, if you want, I can go set that up while you uh, continue on here. That 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 sounds great. So education is one of those things that doesn't necessarily happen in school. Everyone always worries so much about K through 12 learning, about formal university learning, but. When you think back to that aha moment where you first understood how to make something do something, was it you reading in the back of a car? Was it you working in a workshop? Was it you uh, sitting listening to some teacher? Now, for all of us, it was probably a mix of all those different things. There's that planetarium show that just catches your attention, that book that takes you to other worlds. And, and each week we're going to, to work to, to try and introduce you to ways that you can continue as an adult to learn and all these amazing projects that are out there right now that kids and family groups can get involved in. And uh, so, so one of the, the types of things, to give you an example, is last semester we had the folks from the Google Lunar X Prize on uh, to talk about their Moonbots project, which uh, gets kids using uh, software, gets, people, gets kids using educational outreach um, to problem solve the difficulties of exploring the moon. Uh, we're also going to each week try and bring you, and it won't be every week, but try and bring you some sort of a dorky, fun, or explosive, and or super educational and awe-inspiring demo. Uh, this week we're going to show you how to make small weapons with small things. <laughs> well, we're not actually, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, we yep. can hear you fine. Okay, good. The microphone is working. Yay. Um, so I'm not going to actually show you how to make uh, launching of exploding things, and that's actually part of the exciting challenge. So the first uh, little demo that I have, can you still hear me when I move the microphone over there? Yeah. Okay, the first little demo that I have is a little catapult, and uh, this catapult here is uh, put together, as you see, with uh, popsicle sticks and a tongue depressor, and the interesting thing about this, uh, this demonstration is we use it for a reverse engineering demo here at the STEM Center at SIUE. So what we do is we give the students this and say, okay, reverse engineer your own. No instructions. You have to build your own with, you know, this pile of materials here that we give you. But, of course, if you want to learn how to do it, I will share a link later in the broadcast from the other computer over there um, with the actual lesson plan for teachers who want to use this activity in their uh, classroom. But it also comes from this fabulous book called Mini Weapons of Mass Destruction, <laughs> which is one of the, the fabulous things we have in here. And so to start off our launching campaign, I'm going to try. Cameron. I love that. Can, can you, you're we, we're oh, seeing yeah, yeah. you from the shoulders up. There we go. Yay! So we, have, we, have, we have little Einstein, and we have our catapult, and we have various sundry things that we can uh, launch. And the goal is to try and hit the webcam, so. <laughs> that went way over. <laughs> All right, what about the poof ball? Let's see if we get the poof ball. I feel like ball I should duck. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> oh my gosh, just get the little. little... Ah! Yay! You would have win it. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, I'm going to. You may have to deal with a bit of echo as I take my headphones out. Um, 
But, you know, it's not the only weapon we have. They've also let us use the trebuchet. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're George Rao of the tree bucket. <laughs> uh, and so the, I, I don't know if the instructions for that are in that same book, but they have built a trebuchet and filled the basket with lead bricks. And so you actually get uh, quite a, a good... Uh, a good thrust with this thing. So I'm going to go over there and try and shoot it at the camera from there. No person property. Now, now, <laughs> to provide some context for this, um, one of the things that we actually do to our education majors here at SIUE is they're required to take a science methods course um, and also a foundations in science course. And the kids who take the science uh, math, uh, science foundations course, uh, we require them to design something that will meet a very specific task. And one of those some things that's available to them is a trebuchet, and they have to successively be able to fire it to consistently get a hole in one in a can that is a specific distance and height elevation away from the trebuchet. Can you guys see it? Okay, yep. you got to say something because you nodded. Yes, me. sorry. Stop. <laughs> okay, yes. sorry. Yes, we can totally see you. She says that she's about to launch something heavy. All right. <laughs> Did you guys see it? It went clear over the laptop. <laughs> yes. No, but we heard it. Oh, the upward arc. <laughs> I heard crunch. So, so this is how learning occurs. You, you, you take something like this and, and you say, here, figure out how to play with it till you can accurately wipe out somebody else's webcam with it. Right. Learning isn't just sitting and reading, <laughs> isn't just sitting and reading books. Learning isn't just listening to lectures. Learning. I think I think I had the range better this time, but not the aim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have, so, I have uh, one more thing I want to launch for you, uh, because we do want to. Uh, although physics is important, right, Mr. Einstein? Um, we also want to tie some astronomy in, and there's this great little demo of uh, what happens to the layers of a star during a supernova. So as the as a as a as a massive star begins to collapse under its own weight, um, when it reaches the the core, everything it bounces back and expands into this huge explosion that blows off most of the material of the star. So one way we demonstrate that is with a bunch of these bouncy balls, a bunch of bouncy balls on a plastic stick. And this was the top one that I was using. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop it on a flat surface. Actually, I'm going to move the laptop up. Drop it on a flat surface. And so all of these things collapse on each other, but then you get the explosion outward. And hopefully you'll be able to follow some of this. Move laptop, move laptop, move laptop. Okay. You ready? Yep. Let's do it. <laughs> Did you poke a hole in the drop ceiling? <laughs> she wouldn't be the first person to do that. <laughs> no. Yeah, there's, there's, there are multiple holes in the ceiling. So this guy, the top one, bounced down off of these, these other layers of the star, and actually hit the ceiling and probably put another hole uh, up in the gem center. Um, so that's another uh, cute little demo you can, uh, I guess you can usually buy these from toy stores or? I, they, this is a lot of science uh, education places, like Edmund Scientific. If okay. you are a cool parent, you will like buy your kids dead frogs to dissect in the summer, uh, get small telescopes, um, all these different things. You don't have to be a school teacher to get these things. Right. Right. Although I'm not sure dissecting frogs is still as good as it was when I was a kid. Because when I was a kid, frogs were everywhere. Now they're not quite everywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, so so science learning is about being active, about being socially engaged. Uh, 
about trying things, about being willing to be a dork, because because you don't necessarily know what you're doing as you go. That's that's doing science. You're you're experimenting. You're trying, and and so this new learning space that we're creating is is going to be where we pass on to you. Um, it, our understanding of modern K through 12 education, the struggles it's facing, uh, what are all these strange things you hear in the news about the new educational standards, but side by side with that we're going to be showing you the positive stories, the stories of the kids who are launching Camilla into upper levels of our atmosphere, the kids who are building robots to explore the moon, the adults are, who are setting up amazing activities, and uh, our, our goal is to find ways for you to find ways to just keep learning. And, and this is where we'd really like to say, um, what is it that you want to see come out of this show? So this is just going to be part of our new weekly lineup that is pretty much starting today with this show, our learning space. And from here on out, Thursdays, Planetary Society is going to be hosting their own lineup on planetary science every Thursday. Friday is the weekly space hangout that's being produced by our own Nicole Gallucci and hosted by Fraser Kane when he's available. Uh, Sundays, we have our virtual star party in Scott Lewis who's here in the Hangout with us today is going to be uh, co-hosting a Periodic Science Sunday Hangout. Mondays is Astronomy Cast. Tuesdays we're going to be bringing you updates from a variety of different NASA missions. And then Wednesday is Learning Space. And you're going to be able to access all of this content both over at CosmoQuest.org as well as on YouTube through the Astrosphere Vids channel, uh, which is going to be our online home for all of our CosmoQuest created vids. So, so Scott, I know that you're monitoring the, the comments right now. Is, is there right. anything that you see coming in? Well, I see our good friend Gary from the Virtual Star Party saying that we scare Hi, him. Gary. Why do you <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. And, yeah, someone did comment that about needing the book, and I believe you just put up, Nicole, put a, put a link up. I just put up a link to the uh, lesson plans. Those are PDF lesson plans that are free to use. Um, for the catapults, I will also put a link to the book uh, I found it on Amazon earlier today. So okay. those links are both been posted on the event page on Google Plus. So check it out. Um, that tells you how to do the lesson and how to build more tiny, tiny weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> 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 really no, great is... for office warfare. I'm telling you. Um, now, is there a, a project that you guys have done or had to do on the opposite end of it that you guys really enjoyed? being, you know, that allowed you to learn something out of the box oh, instead man. of through a book? So, so here, here's something that I think is actually relevant, particularly this time of year. When I was a kid, and I, I hate myself, I can't remember what year it was, but the New England Patriots, I'm a Bostonian at heart, uh, grew up in Westford, Mass. The New England Patriots yes. were uh, in the Super Bowl, Bowl against the Miami Dolphins. And my dad and I spent the entire football game building a little sound activated. It was like the clap on, clap off of little robots. You clapped and it would start going. And uh, when you clapped again, it would stop going. And when it hit something, it would spin and bounce off in a new direction. And, and we made a bet on, on whichever one of us won the bet got to have physical custody in their room for the robot. Uh, the reality is it ended up living in the living room. Um, <laughs> but it, it was this awesome little kit and a soldering, um, a, a soldering gun is not the right word, soldering iron. 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 Yes, a gun would be so much better. Um, a soldering iron was involved and playing with electricity and a voltmeter to check that we had everything working correctly. And and I don't remember who won that game. I'm sure someone in the audience can tell us. But I do remember building that little robot. And then he and I went on from there to building a full-sized glider. Not full, full-size, but like glider that, that I, I can't back up enough from the camera to do like how big the wingspan of the glider was. And um, unfortunately, the first time we launched it, he's like, no, you can't control it, you child. He didn't sound like a caveman when he did it. But um, so he had the controls. I launched it and he flew it straight into a tree. So that, that's one of those times you learn something about your dad. But 
it, it was these hands-on building something got me to the point where I'm not afraid of power tools. I'm the one that uses the Sawzall to install the dog door in our house. And um, don't be afraid to use tools. Uh, use them safely. You can cut off digits or electrocute yes. yourself. Um, but now as a teacher, one of the things that when I'm teaching physics I force my students to do is dumpster dive a school project. Go out, uh, find that piece of random electronics in your house that's outdated and not really in use. Go to Radio Shack, spend 10 bucks on things like resistors and capacitors and transformers and build something. One of my students, she managed to rewire an electric clock so that when the alarm went off, a Christmas tree light inside of a rubber bathtub ducky, like one of those like stupid rubber duckies from uh, Sesame Street would start lighting up and flashing along with the noise the alarm clock made. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was it absolutely awesome. awesome. And she was just a pre-med student who'd never played with electricity in her life. So that that's what I do to my students. What what about you, Nicole? You you are like way above me in the electronics ability and stuff. Uh, no, I pretend a lot. <laughs> um, I didn't start so young. I started in grad school. So late. Um, but actually, I had a little book when I was a kid. It was a little science book, and it was I can't remember the name of the science center out in California. It was attached to somebody hands on science. Oh, the Exploratorium. Thank you. Um, it was from the yes. Exploratorium. Oh, I kept thinking Eureka. But that's, that's a sci-fi show. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I had a little exploratorium book, and it had lots of little things. And one of the things they had were those little, um, the little, uh, like, like gratings so you could see everything in rainbow. And I oh, yeah. Of the hard oh, box. I have one of those. And I love these, because you can, like, put them on a kid and just entertain them, because they're going to look at everything. I wonder what does in the webcam. Yeah, that's what oh, I was about to do no, with yeah, that. Of... <laughs> it sort of works. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I played with those all the time. And then it also came with little packets of agar powder or ag agar gel. Maybe I'm, I'm sorry, biologist, if I'm saying this wrong. But um, I used it to do a science fair experiment when I was in sixth grade uh, where I decided to see if the age of a person has any... Um, uh, if there's any correlation between the age of a person and the amount of bacteria they have growing in their mouth. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome! And so I went around and slobbed my family's mouths <laughs> and grew the cultures in this agar gel that came in this exploratorium book. <laughs> and wouldn't you know, I went to the regional science fair and won on an honorable That's mention. That's awesome! That's awesome. And even better was the week before it was supposed to be presented in class, they weren't growing fast enough, so I started a second group of them. And so my mother let me use her pantry, this like empty pantry in the basement, to store all these bowls. Growing cultures from my family's mouths. Um, <laughs> that was so. My hands-on, uh, hands-on science experiences were really gross and awesome. That's, That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> See, I, I was, I was like, my mom's a teacher, and so I, I got to be subjected to many different things as curricula changes. Um, so I remember growing up, and yet. Yeah, dissecting cow eyeballs just because there's extra ones from her, her class that day. And so, yes, we get to dissect things and see what's going on and some frogs. Um, one thing I really liked, I remember being in fourth grade, and I don't know if they do it anymore, but I know that Lego does not does a lot of things. Mindstorms. Well, it wasn't Mindstorms back then. Yeah. But it was, I think it was like Technics, I think it's called. But, yeah, you're engineering, essentially. You're engineering and, and making things work and just trying to build things and see if you can keep them going for a certain amount of time. But I, I think my absolute favorite was that we had to build a car. Um, and we had to build a car, and the only thing we could use as its motor was a mousetrap. Oh, yeah, yeah. We do those so. with our, our uh, Science Foundation students. And it's because it makes you think, and you know, you have yeah. to realize what what do I need to do as far as do I need to extend the lever? What type of wheels should I be using? What should I be using for the axles? And need to find the friction coefficients, and so which one's going to be the best way as, as far as maintaining your distance? And so we we had that as a final project, and whoever won because it was a bunch of groups, so whoever won out of all the groups got you know I think a couple points. 
points extra credit for it. So you got competitive with it as well. So there's something, you know, you got some pride on the line as well as the sneaking in the fact that you're learning mechanics and, and how everything works together. So that was one of my favorites. Mine did not win because um, as I was pulling it out of the car, someone kicked open their door from it from inside there and smashed it but yeah. I fixed it I got an A I fixed it within 20 minutes of having to race because I brought my hot glue gun with me but it, it you learn to adapt and overcome too when you see things because things break all the time and yeah. Like, yeah, well, that didn't work and it's okay to fail it's okay for things to break and you have to think of different ways of approaching it I think well that's one great thing about it and, and what's amazing is how passionate people will get. We, we do the mousetrap cars with our Science Foundation students. So a group of them will do catapults, a group of them will do trebuchets, a group of them will do matchbot cars, and not matchbot, mousetrap cars, and a group of them will do Rube Goldberg experiments. And um, the mousetrap car ones, they, they are required for their car to go a certain distance plus or minus a very small amount in a certain amount of time plus or minus a certain amount so we totally forced them to over engineer everything about this and that whole getting it to campus is where the world usually ends for them and that's what gets them to to have to deal with all the things that real scientists do of the oh no how do I debug this in real time right and, and yeah it's it's awesome but not all science necessarily has to be exploding things in real life well, I think you brought up a really good point about real science, too, is that there's you not only have to build it and make it work, but then when it comes to transporting or getting your experiment where it needs to be, there's a whole different side of logistics you need to think about. I, I know with the James Webb Space Telescope coming up, they have to transport the, the full-scale model of it to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest. Where we will be. Well, that's where, yeah, we will be there this March. But there's this thing's the size of a tennis court, and they need to find a way to bring it across the country. So not only do we have some awesome piece of equipment, but now you have to actually think about, okay, how do I get it there? Can things just stay in the lab? No, not, they can't always no. stay in the lab. You need to find a way of not only making this work, but also making it be able to move around and get it where you need to be. Now, now I know, uh, Nicole, I think you had a question yeah. that you pulled up uh, from one of the users. No, I just lost it. Well. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we had a, when I get back to the education theme, um, we had a comment asking, oh, there it is. Haha, what is your opinion on the worldwidetelescope.org as a learning tool? Do you have any advice for how to use that with school kids? So, so the wonderful thing about the World Wide Telescope is it really allows you to understand the motions in the sky and the diversity of the sky across different wavelengths. So you can do a lot of what seem like really simple activities but force you to just go, oh wow, I hadn't realized that. Uh, so you can do something as simple as saying, I'm going to look at a certain place in the sky and then just let time walk by. And you can do this on the order of hours and see how the sky rotates over a night. You can do this in 24-hour increments and see how the entire sky is constantly changing throughout the year. And then you can do this in centuries and see, uh, as you go through the thousands of years, how, how our sky is precessing. At the same time, you can look at something like the Eagle Nebula, which is this beautiful cloud of star formation and nebulae. And as you step through the variety of wavelengths, you can start to see the young stars forming. You can start to peer through the gas and dust. And you can really understand how amazing uh, using science in all the different colors of light that range from the colors that your iPad or whatever uses to connect to the Wi-Fi to the colors related to your cell phone out through the infrared that gives you a sunburn. All these different colors that we experience, not necessarily as light, but as, as action here on Earth, um, get turned into science when we look skyward. I think you, ultraviolet light causes a sunburn. Yeah, ultraviolet. <laughs> what, oh, yes. yes <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> We have a demo for that as well, but I don't have we a do, We do, we do. Please that, don't use me as your demo. demo I, I burst into flames <laughs> you if are, I'm you in the sun pale. too long. I'm quite pale too. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, I just tan. I had a lot oh, I hate you. <laughs> I burn. I, yeah, I had a lot of experience um, doing hands-on activities with science when I worked with Dark Skies Bright Kids in Virginia. It's a group that does astronomy outreach, astronomy clubs for elementary school children.
Hi, Nicole here. Uh, if you were watching this live, uh, you know that we lost the feed and couldn't get a Hangout restarted. Um, something was going on, we think, on Google's side because we tried it from three different locations. Uh, but it happens. Tech, tech problems happen. Uh, so I wanted to thank you for watching. Um, keep watching every Wednesday at the same time. We'll have a different topic. We'll have guests. Uh, we'll have uh, some more fun live demos. And also, um, I wanted to... Um, uh, do the NASA calendar giveaway. These fantastic NASA calendars that we got at the American Astronomical Society meeting. So um, I put a link to the blog in the uh, comment section. I will link to it at the bottom of this as well. Um, there is a secret phrase, and the secret phrase is learning hangout. That is one word. If you are not a CosmoQuest member, you want to sign up for a new account on CosmoQuest using learning hangout as your referrer. Then your referral code. Uh, and then from there, we need you to go to one of the science projects, Moon Mappers or Vesta Mappers or, or Mercury Mappers, and actually do a um, do an image, mark up an image with surface features. If you are already a CosmoQuest member, then there will be a link to a specific forum post you need to go to. Go to the forum, put in the learning hangout, one word, uh, secret phrase, and uh, also mark up an image and put the screen cap on your forum post. Uh, that is it. I will link to those instructions. Remember, learning hangout. Learning hangout. That is your secret phrase. Thank you so much for watching.